Modern biology as we know it began with the discovery of cells. Anything before that is ancient or medieval biology. Those we will not be covering. The significance of those two eras of biology is not nearly as much as that in modern biology. So let's jump right in. Today we'll be covering the different people who kickstarted and put set set our biology uh, biological discoveries in motion. And then we'll look at why those figures are significant. Let's all jump into the time machine of biology and go back in time to meet one of these people. That person is Robert Hooke. Robert Hooke lived in London and he worked as the president of the Royal Society of scientists during his time. If you guys are un uh, unaware, the Royal Society, it, it's an organization that still persists, and it features the top minds of England and Scotland. And during his time, he was the president. So that just shows how talented of a scientist he was. Apart from being a scientist, he also was a businessman. He was, uh, he was a professor, really, a renaissance man. One day, Hook decided, wouldn't it be cool to look at plant specimens under a microscope? When you look at this first picture here, you'll see that this microscope looks ancient and not very effective. You'd be right on both of those assumptions. What he saw was truly fascinating, and it kickstarted modern biology as we know it. But before we take a look at what Hook saw under his microscope, I'd like to bring up the fact that the reason why lots of people don't know about Hook and his significance in biology is because of our friend, Isaac Newton. Yes, Newton, the guy. Yes, him. Newton claimed that he had discovered the laws of motion, the famed three laws of motion first. But Hook challenged him and said, hey, I was the first to discover the laws of motion. Later on, when Hook died, well, Newton, being unhappy with Hook's interference, destroyed all traces of Hook's legacy, including his portrait. So this right here, although lots of people may think that this is Robert Hook, is not actually Robert Hook. These portraits, none of them are accurate. And in one of my biology classes for elementary schoolers, a student of mine told me and her peers after being asked the question, what does Robert Hook look like? She merely said, he wears a wig. And you'd be completely right on that as well. But we do not know what Robert Hook looks like. This is what Robert Hook saw under his microscope. These specimens of cork, which are dead plant materials, show that he saw these little compartments. And he drew a connection between these compartments and monastery cells. So monastery cells were the rooms in which monks lived in during his day. Because he drew this connection, he named what he saw cells. And that's where we get our name for the basic biological unit nowadays. Let's meet another one of our friends, Anton von Leeuwenhoek. Leeuwenhoek lived during Hook's time in the golden age of the Netherlands, so he's Dutch. He decided to take things up a notch. So instead of being out and look, uh, look at boring plant specimens, why not look at Conwire? What he saw was something that man had never seen before. He saw thousands of tiny little creatures swimming around. He decided, hmm, these tiny little animals, guess I'll just call them animal kills. So tiny animals swimming in pond water. However, during this time, both Hook and Leibniz were unaware that these things, these animal kills, were cells, and cells form all components of life, including us. That would have to wait till three German scientists 
Schwann, Schleiden, and Bierkopf would discover and theorize that the different uh, that all of these things are made out of cells. Then we have Francesco Redi. Francesco Redi was an Italian scientist, and he's most known for disproving one of the common theories of the time. People of his time were a little strange in what they believed. For instance, people of his time thought that meat, just a chunk of meat, would generate maggots. So you put out a chunk of meat, boom, maggots appear. Well, we know that today that is very much not true. But that's what those people believed, me, uh, believed in at the time. This theory was called the theory of spontaneous generation. Francesco Redi did not like this theory, so he set up an experiment. He set out two jars of raw meat, one covered with gauze, and the other one left open. After a few days of waiting, flies and maggots had gathered in the open jar, but in the closed jar with gauze, there were no flies nor maggots to be seen. The results of his experiment proved that living things must arise from other living things. You can't just have a non-living thing and that generate a new living thing. The same theory goes for cells. All cells arise from other cells. So that theory that he disproved was extremely significant to our understanding of modern biology. And last but definitely not least, we have Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel was also a very interesting scientist. Actually, we shouldn't call him a scientist. He was a monk. You might be asking, well, how does a monk be a scientist at the same time? Back in the day, monasteries were not only places of worship, but they were also institutions. And these monks had to run their own monastery. So there's a certain amount of science that can be really related to running a monastery. Gregor Mendel studied peas. Yes, pea plants. And from that, he discovered and fathered modern genetics. So very cool. Uh, and he, uh, he discovered the basis of modern genetics by, by observing the different traits inherited in pea plants. Flower color, pod size, pea shape, all of these he drew out in something primitive that we now know as the Punnett square. He drew out the possibilities for all the offspring's traits and from that discovered dominant and recessive traits. If you, are, uh, if you do not yet know what dominant and recessive traits are, basically those traits coexist and they define who you are. Let's take me for an example. I am the splitting image of my father. I have traits for appearance from both my father and my mother, but my mother's traits for appearance are apparently recessive to my father's dominant traits. So in any organism for any alleles or genes, they receive two copies from their parents, one from mom, one from dad, but it depends on which ones are masked and which ones are not. These four scientists would ultimately shape modern biology as it is today and contribute to our natural understanding of the world. Thank you, and let's give these four figures a round of applause.